come from a place where three rivers meet, and the name for that is Nistawayasik. And my people are native people. That means that we come from the fourth direction. And our people have been within our homeland since time started. We have managed the land and the water, the resources. And these knowledge has been passed on from generation to generation. Deep in the heart of northern Manitoba, in and around the town of Nelson House, is the home of the Nisichiwasik Cree Nation. Even though our people have thrived for generations, our existence has been increasingly threatened over the last century. Now we face our greatest challenge ever. We are at a crossroads in our nation's history, and we are divided over which route to take. This critical choice we must all make will change our fate. Our vote will determine if and how we will survive as a people. To choose wisely, we must understand who we are and where we have come from. To the Aboriginal people of long ago, I think that they sort of lived in peace, in harmony with nature and the Creator Himself. They sort of just lived, lived their lives the way they wanted to and they enjoyed it. Yeah. Hunting and fishing and trapping, um, that has always been a, a way of our, of our life. That's how we live from day to day. That's where our food came from, that's where our clothing came from, and that's where some of our shelter came from. The people were very strong and very resilient. They moved from one place to another to another. They believed they had the right to exploit some areas and some things, but as long as it was done uh, in a balanced way. And when they felt that they had stayed somewhere long enough, they would then make a decision to, to then move to another area so that this particular area that they utilized would be allowed to replenish itself. They didn't overfish, they didn't overhunt. They managed their own resources. They treated nature uh, with a great deal of respect. They performed ceremonies prior to utilizing the resources of the land and, and, and just had a very strong belief in, uh, in a supreme being that looked after them. So they're really uh, a good, uh, caring people that were very uh, independent, but uh, in a very, in a, in a strong yet gentle sort of way. Wherever they went, there was always families, two, three families staying in one, one area. The reason why they did that is so, so one man gets hurt, there was always somebody else to look after the other family. Even the women were good workers in this. They could do everything.
When we hunted something, we, we never wasted it. When I caught a fish and, and my family was full, I never gave it to them. I gave it to my neighbor who was hungry, who, who wasn't quite the fisherman. I'm not, the, I'm, not, I'm not quite the trapper, right? Come trapping season, you know, he, he, he helps me out. If you couldn't hunt or fish, you know, well, that was recognized. You had a different skill that was focused on it, and that was your, that was your role. That was your part that you played in our camp. They had ways of uh, coming together and celebrating who they were. They had their values, what they considered to be their laws that came from their observations of nature. They uh, have what they call these days natural laws that they live by and that they governed themselves by. And they did that for, for a very, very long time, since time immemorial. I guess you can say that they were one with nature. They were there. And uh, as the years went by, I don't think things changed that much through the years. What the elders could see is that the thousands of years of living this way would soon come to an end. It's the early 18th century when strangers first come to our homeland. These visitors are attracted by the rich and plentiful wildlife here. And they're impressed by our people's ability to harvest these resources and survive on the land. Yet this contact with the white man would dramatically transform the lives of our people forever. The people maybe at, at the first were sort of hesitant hesitant in the fact that they didn't know who these people were, where they came from, what they wanted. They were there to collect beaver. They were collect their, any kind of fur. And I think oh, that once the people realized what they were looking for, they were more than willing to, to help them. Nelson House is uh, it's a fur trading post. It was a it's a good place to be stationed by the uh, northern store, Hudson Bay store. And the fur traders used to come here. There wasn't that much money in them days. Before, all the, it was a trade, food for fur or clothing. The fur trade allows our people to not only obtain food and clothing, but guns and other materials to help us adapt to this new world of the 18th and 19th centuries. We become less nomadic as we gravitate along fur trading routes. But our sovereignty is undermined by the government as it declares that Aboriginal people are subjects of the Crown, even though we never agree to that. The Canadian government, uh, or at the time, uh, the British government, they, they make assertions that uh, we are indeed their subjects and they, they treat uh, our subjugation as if it uh, really did happen. In, in fact, it did not happen, but nonetheless, uh, they do treat it like as if it, uh, if it, did, uh, like it did happen. Eventually, our Nisituasic Cree Nation signs Treaty 5 in 1908. We agree to share our resources while the Federation of Canada promises to help our people adjust to living in the 20th century. But it's the Canadian government's mistaken view that Aboriginal people are their subjects that brings the most drastic change yet to the life we have lived for thousands of years. It's like only the last hundred years that we've been confined to living in communities. So I mean, you know, it took a lot out of the, the life that we once enjoyed. You know, right from even from the day one that white man first met the Aboriginal people, there was that that thought of saying, hey, I want to hold you where you are. I'll do what I want with you, but hold you to where you are. 
after signing treaty, we were herded like cows and uh, unconfined in the reservation. At one time, we weren't allowed to go out of the reservation without the government's permission. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to put them on a piece of land and keep them there to sort of to keep the people at the, at, at the community where the government had the upper hand of it. That's the time the government uh, issued these blankets were infected with disease. And that's the time I lost my grandmother. I didn't. I didn't even see her. It still hurts me. I call that uh, biological warfare. I call that terrorism. When the missionaries came to our, our community, you know, they thought we were worshiping the sun and the moon. We were worshiping elements, the eagle. They didn't understand us. <laughs> They took our, our sacred objects, our drums and rattles. I don't know, they burned them, buried them. I know they, some sacred objects were thrown in the water. And I know some of them, uh, they sold these sacred objects. Religion came and the churches came and it changed a lot of uh, the mentality of our people. It changed a lot of the context, you know, to the fear-based uh, beliefs. Under this assault to our culture and our health, we managed to survive by practicing traditional beliefs and by living off the land. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, Many of us are scattered across our homeland, in and around Nelson House, South Indian Lake, Wasquatam, and many other places, as Mother Earth and all her teachings continues to be our lifeline. The area where we grew up was beautiful, had beaches and everything, and um, I remember horses running wild in the community or chasing kids. I remember us raiding uh, gardens. There's a lot of community gardens, and um, it was a lot of family things that were done in the community, and um, it was a really nice childhood. I was born in Pasquatum. It was a, sort of a central place for the people of not only Nelson House, but the surrounding area. They frequented the area because of the, the abundance of wild food, berries, uh, medicine, everything that connects with the traditional ways of life of the people at that time there. I was born in South Indian Lake in 1937. As I grew up, I learned how to survive in the, in the wild. I learned how to fish, I learned how to trap. The most important thing is learn how to travel. If you know where you're going, know how you're dressed, and you know the weather, and you know your directions. And that's what I was taught and, uh, by my mom and my dad, my sisters, and my brothers. Where the three, three rivers meet, uh, that's the, uh, the Burnwood River, the Rod River, and the uh, Footprint River. It, it was beautiful, uh, full of marsh. As a young man, it, my, my grandfather had taken me out and teaching me certain things, how to respect certain things. Like everything uh, was provided for us here in this world. We have to uh, somehow manage it. You could go down to the lake shore, you could see the bottom. You could see medicines growing, you could see beaches that used to be all around this lake. Mr. 
I was raised by my grandparents uh, on land. I uh, actually lived off the land before highways or electricity or and uh, lived in uh, fish camps and trap lines and uh, learned the traditional skills and values of uh, and respect of the land. By the time I was eight years old, I knew, I knew how to fish, I knew how to trap, I knew how to even mend net, nets for fishing. I was given by my mother to my uh, grandparents uh, when I was just a baby and uh, other than nurses and the Indian Affairs agent. We didn't have much contact with the outside world and my grandparents raised me up as best they could in a traditional environment uh, where there was a lot of hunting and fishing and trapping. We traveled on an 18-foot canoe with uh, the whole family plus all our gear and few dogs, no life jackets because we felt so safe traveling on these rivers. The shorelines are so beautiful. People had gardens along the shoreline, big gardens. I think every household had a garden. <laughs> We had no uh, deep freeze system days, you have to remember, so we have to uh, pound it or meat and uh, dry it up, make pemmican and stuff like that. I remember eating that and then I remember making it. In the fall time, the lake would all freeze over black. And we had big skating parties. And I remember skating from Dog Point to Poplar Point, And they had bonfires all, over, all over in the shorelines. And people would be visiting from one bonfire to the next. And it was wonderful. And the adults would be all there, and we'd be playing games. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. It's everything you do is enjoyment. When you're skinning the moose, hauling it out, that's enjoyment. That's the way I was brought up. I instantly go back, snap of a finger, I go back to living that style. At that time, Everyone had a role, from the grandparents, to the parents, to the children. They all had a role to play in surviving. They shared with what, they, what little they had, and people were happy, and they, there was no envy, there was no um, hatred, there was a lot of love. You could feel the aura of the people that were there and the reverence that they had, you know, be uh, with, with nature itself. Throughout the 20th century, living a traditional lifestyle allows our people to thrive with healthy minds, bodies, and spirits. The key to maintaining this holistic way of life for many thousands of years is the ability to pass our knowledge down from one generation to the next. But this continuum of spirit and tradition is threatened when the opportunity to teach our children is taken away. A total change took, took hold of my life at that time. And uh, like it was no choice of mine, but the choice of the government of the day to, for me to leave the community and go out to residential school. When I was born, I was never registered which I guess I was lucky because I never experienced the residential school system. I stayed home. All the children disappeared in the fall. I was the only one around. They started taking 
the children from their families. And they were going to teach these children about God, about God's love. And at the same time, they were abusing these kids mentally, emotionally, physically and sexually. You know, some of the kids, when they told their parents, the parents wouldn't believe. How can a holy man do this? How can a teacher do this? And some of these people have passed on with that bitterness and that pain in, still inside them. There was a group of us, so that helped. Uh, if I went by myself, truthfully, I probably wouldn't have never made it. We supported each other, and uh, <clears throat> that's how we, uh, I guess, survived. In one way or another, they wanted to hold us down, teach us to be, you know, to be humble and not be able, not, not retaliate in anything that was being done. As our people struggle against this ongoing change, we managed to achieve success through the 1950s and 60s by working together and supporting each other. Our commercial fishery becomes world-renowned, while other resource harvesting also thrives. But we are unaware that we would soon be facing another major impact in our community. The, the community sort of built itself up to to sort of, you know, where the people were living comfortably. They had uh, the housing program that started, and people were getting into new homes, the roads were upgraded, and the people were, to me, they were happy, you know, and things were going were going good within the community. It seemed like the, the community was gonna, was gonna go places. And I think mean, it was, 1967, I heard about the Churchill River Diversion. The Churchill River Diversion is a project Manitoba Hydro begins planning in the late 1960s. The idea, divert the Churchill River at Missy Falls on Southern Indian Lake and push this water south through the Rat and Burntwood Rivers into the Nelson River, where more water could flow through the hydro-generating stations being constructed along the Lower Nelson. As this would cause flooding throughout our homeland, it seems our people don't exist in the eyes of the outside world. The province and the federal government really had no, no communications with, with the people of Nelson House. South Indian, or for that, anybody else in the area that was going to be affected by the Churchill River Diversion. The first thing I learned was that it was already being worked on. People were out in the field doing whatever, I guess, to, to start the construction. At that time, they didn't uh, ask for our input or ask for our consent. They even, they even ignored the cries of our elders. You know, their, their belief with respect to the land. Once the people found out of how much flooding there was gonna be, that's when the feelings of the people started to come out. They didn't want it. Because they, they knew that it was gonna destroy their, well, their way of life. I'm not the same here. Nikanik <laughs> Oh yeah, my, well, my, my, my grandfather, my, my great-grandfather, Basil Colomb, had fought really hard against the Churchill River diversion, actually. He was one of the, the main guys who fought hard in there. We 
we were working towards to try and get an injunction, an injunction that would get Hydro, the province, and the federal government to do, to do an environmental study, to let the people know, so that they would, you know, prepare themselves for it. But it never happened. As our people fight hard to stop the project, the government is determined to build the Churchill River diversion. At that time, I think it was Premier Ed Schreier was a premier, right? He uh, said, so there's nothing we can do. They've already, they've already have men there. They have all kinds of equipment there. Uh, the process had started. It's like, it's like a stone going down the hill. And there's nothing we can do about it. I think I was just a teenager then, the water came up. Well, actually, first it disappeared, you know, it really just went down to nothing, and then water came up, 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 it never stopped. Before this came, nobody really paid attention to how much damage it was going to do. Nobody expected it to be that bad. The damage is severe because of our permafrost soil. Once flooded, it melts quickly and continues to erode until the water hits bedrock. As the shoreline crumbles, the water fills with debris and becomes more turbid. An organic reaction in the fish causes some species to be contaminated with mercury. By building the Churchill River diversion, the government not only fails to consider the impact on our people, but also the enormous damage it would cause to our land and our water. Traditionally, you didn't live too far from the shoreline. That's where all the fur-bearing animals, the, the diggity birds, the rodents, that's where the, the life of uh, most animals, nature, insects, that's where it happens, from the water level to up to at least uh, 50, 100 feet up, which they call a riparian zone. That's the same thing with our tradition, our culture. That's where we're part of that riparian zone. And that was taken away. If, you, if you're born in the, in the wilderness or in the bush or in a, in a reserve like this, you're out there every day, nobody telling you what to do, you're your own boss, and you, you go out there and you get your own meat, you get your own fish. And if you can't do that, that hurts. Back then, we'd come home with tubs and tubs of fish, and today, when you go out there to check a net, you're lucky if you, if you find a couple of fish on your and you're on your net, and when you do find fish, they're polluted with mercury, and your net is full of debris. It damages your nets. I've been up and down that river for the last 30 years, and I still don't know, know it. I travel that same road when the water is eight feet up. Then if the water goes down eight feet, I hit a rock. The fluctuation goes up and down, up and down. That. That distracts the, the young uh, guys uh, from going out from, and were scared they'll tip over when they hit a log. And we did lose uh, quite a few fishermen when uh, we don't know what happened. It's very tough traveling around the waters around here. You gotta be 100% respond, respond to the water your way around. You gotta be focused at all times without hitting debris, get into a bad accident. It has happened. Um, now you can't, you can't even go out. Uh, you don't know what the level of the water is. You don't know what's in the bottom. Um, I wouldn't send my children down and, uh, because of safety and concerns. When you want to go to your trap line in the winter time, it's very dangerous um, because of the slush, because of the water fluctuations. I've dealt with it and tried to, to, to survive on something that I can't control, like the water fluctuation. I try to commercial fish, I try to trap, and I, I fished in the winter where there's, after you chop the whole water, just, the pressure just squirts the water out and you get flooded out. People have um, gone through the ice. My husband has gone through the ice twice when he, when he has gone out for sustenance. You were, you were there for a purpose, trying to, to uh, make a living. And that hurts when you have to pull up and leave and go elsewhere. After the flood, we weren't able to 
to the ice didn't freeze like it did and so there went the 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 skating parties and um and things began to change there are no grassy rivers in the flooded area because of the debris the mud the erosion geese used to nest all around this community in this area different kind of uh waterfowl, the, the cranes, uh, ducks. Uh, it changed the, the migrating path of certain waterfowl, certain species. There was an abundance of, of wild meat, fish, and all of a sudden it, like, it was like a dead stop. And then all of a sudden it was welfare. You know, they were living off welfare, handled from the government. And they weren't used to that. They were used to supplying their own their own food, bringing their own food in. As our resource harvesting is devastated by this and the anti-fur lobby, our community's health suffers economically, physically, and spiritually. <laughs> There's been an increase of illnesses and um, mostly diabetes and a high rate of cancer. This lake that we get our water from was once a beautiful lake with sparkling water. Now it's a big reservoir of polluted water with floating debris. It's so sad, it just breaks my heart. And there are so many names that have been called by the water and by the creator because of this project, because of what they did to our sacred sites. We need to protect these sites and the government people and developers need to know the significance of those secret sites and the significance of our relationship with the land. Socially, a lot of people um, now, is, especially now with children, um, there's a lot of uh, concentration with uh, bad habits like uh, the alcohol, drugs. It's big time. They, they've lost their way of life and uh, the respect the respect for themselves, their own selves, their body, their their mind, their soul, their spirit. There's too many people drunk every day. I'm getting sick of it. There's too many deaths and suicides. It's too much. I don't know, everybody thinks about money now. Not really any sacred stuff anymore. Uh, it doesn't seem traditional. Unfortunately, there's a lot of elders that um, actually lived off the land. To this day, have never gone to the lake or walked down to the lake because there was, that's how affected they were. In the wake of this devastation, our nation and four other bands impacted by hydro development negotiate a deal to be compensated by Manitoba Hydro and the governments of Manitoba and Canada. The 1977 Northern Flood Agreement promises to pay us for our lost livelihoods. But the agreement gets bogged down and compensation flows slowly over the next decade and a half. As our community remains impoverished, it seems the only ones profiting from the Northern Flood Agreement are the deal's negotiators. 15, 16 years in negotiations. 
you know, all these lawyers were getting rich off us and consultants, and I just didn't think that that was right. So we decided that the new council, it was a pretty young council, and we decided that, okay, let's go for it, and we did. In March 1996, our leadership negotiates a compensation package including $64 million. Our community invests about one quarter of this in buying the Mystery Lake Hotel in Thompson and in building several projects in Nelson House, such as a personal care home, a wellness center, a medicine lodge, and many other improvements. The rest, about $40 million, is put in trust giving us approximately $3.9 million a year in interest to sustain ourselves. I still don't think it's enough, you know, $40 million. All the money they've generated is probably $400 million, maybe a billion dollars. Compared to what the government's making off our resources, you know, they're the ones that are getting rich and living a good lifestyle while our people are still suffering and being impacted. You know, how, how do you compensate livelihood? You know, I don't think you can, you can put a number on somebody's livelihood, you know, to sustain their family, their community. So uh, I don't know what the price tag would that be. The way they compensated was not, not fair at all. Not all choppers were recognized. Not all choppers were paid fairly. Same thing with the commercial fishermen. My grandfather went to his grave without one dime coming to him from the Church of River Diversion. And I have a real concern about that. I understand the people who believe that uh, we should have gotten more considering the impacts. And I have to agree to a certain extent, but I also have to respect the negotiated settlement. But at the same time, uh, you know, there comes a point in time when you have to, uh, I, I suppose, uh, cut your losses and uh, you know, take what you can and uh, uh, make the best use of, uh, of that resource. We had to start looking at opportunities. I mean, just from, you know, uh, signing the deal, I mean, we've built a number of homes in, in the community and a lot of people being hired. I mean, uh, the community's moved forward quite a bit. While compensation and the ongoing cleanup are important, there's something more significant than money in the 1996 agreement. Our leaders insist that the deal contain Article 8, a guarantee that this would never happen again. They negotiated for an Article 8 process uh, to be included in, in the agreement, uh, whereby if there is to be any other future development within our traditional territory, that uh, Manitoba Hydro uh, and the governments would be forced to come to us first before they even uh, uh, do anything. For over a century, our people have coped with the impacts of contact with the non-Aboriginal world. Now we would have to make the most of the money from this compensation deal. Ironically, it's the agreement's promise of never again, Article 8, which quickly and unexpectedly brings about our greatest opportunity to control our future. We didn't expect it to happen so fast, you know, within a couple of years, two or three years after that, uh, there was discussions that were um, related to Article 8 in terms of Wasquadam being developed. It is the late 1990s when Manitoba Hydro invites us to the negotiating table for the first time. Under discussion, building a new hydroelectric dam and power station at Tiskinigup Falls near Wasquadam. This time, our people would decide if it's built, and if so, we would have a share in the profits from the energy sales. But the idea of building another hydro project is hard for some of us to imagine. You have the nerve to come back to our people again and to try and negotiate with us to get another project up. Outraged. I was really mad. Just at the thought of going through this again, look at the destruction, you know, I just, that's all I told them was the destruction, the apathy of our people, you know, it's just no hope for the future. It's destruction all over again. I was outraged. One in I am Mikistan Gate going. You were so on your work. And two Timitica are taking part to Sinana Capitol, my tapi, Mamma Wapiak. 
tu capitán, Utana quita pitán, tanto tan secato de la gente ronge ton. You know, we, we trust the elders' wisdom and knowledge and understanding. They've lived through the Church of River Diversion. They know the impacts, and what they fear is for our people to be destroyed. I don't want to spend the rest of my life uh, uh, complaining about something that has already happened, uh, complaining about the negative impacts that it has on me. And so, well, I, I can't undo the damage uh, that's been done, uh, but I can certainly do uh, everything I can to make sure that uh, the same situation that existed before does not uh, uh, occur again. You can't be looking back and knowing where you're going. So we kind of, kind of, have to learn from that and move forward. I did see the, the damage, eh? Being, uh, my, my dad was a fisherman, I, I did see the water fluctuate up and down rapidly, and it would affect the fishing industry in my community. But as far as what I feel about hydro, I really have no animosity over hydro. Ask for 1,000 is this is good in my hydro. That's why people are very leery to vote because of the broken promises and we were told that there'd be minimal damage and the damage is severe. When somebody hurts you, I grew up, my mom used to forgive them, give them another chance, you know. People have done that for my life. So, you know, hydro has destroyed a lot of my resource area. But they're coming out in good faith, as far as I know, on what I've read. And I'm pleased with uh, how they're conducting themselves this time around, informing us and not just building a dam behind our backyard without us even knowing it till it was complete. So I, I would give them another chance. I, in my opinion, uh, I trust them. I had to go through a lot of prayer, a lot of understanding for me to get to where I am now. Now I'm for Waskwadam. I'm for it. And I have to let go of the past because if I, if I can't let go of the the source of the past, I'll be sick. I would never be able to move forward, and we have to try and move forward for the future of our children. You know, to me, if somebody regrets of what they did in the past, I don't think that they would try to do it again. Would you? Since 1998, our community's leadership has been working with Manitoba Hydro on a deal to build the Waskwadam Dam. Never before has a Crown Corporation decided to include a First Nation as a potential partner. For the first time, our people are not just at the negotiating table, but are also being employed by this process, mostly through our community's Future Development Office. What we've tried to do uh, as a community is try and maximize employment situations for our people, so that our people are the ones that are, are making the money. And of course, you can't completely eliminate lawyers and consultants. Uh, so, but we try to keep them to a minimum. They they make their money, uh, but our community people as well uh, uh, get to make money. And uh, we try to, uh, to do the best we can to spread the wealth uh, uh, to the community members uh, in, in a way that wasn't done before. Hiring my own people to be involved in the environmental impact uh, assessment, uh, taking into consideration the use of uh, traditional knowledge, have, have made this uh, process unique. They're doing a tremendous favor to Nels Nels by, by inviting them to be partners with them. Because maybe, maybe they are guilty of what happened with the CRD and what things that they did. There's a, a big difference between now and then. You know, back then we didn't have anybody to, to stand up for us, but now we have ourselves to, to you know, to, to negotiate for, for ourselves.
Over the past five years, Manitoba Hydro has supported our people's desire to journey out to Wasquatam and other sacred sites. The Manitoba government and Manitoba Hydro have also joined our community in these ceremonies. At these places, we reflect on the decision we are about to make. The significance of a ceremony over there is because, you know, that used to be one of the communities where people used to gather. And it's, it's to honor them, the, honor the, the ancestors, honor the, the, great, the great spirits that, that were there, you know. It's just out of respect for the land as well, to, to bless the land. If there's any disrespect to the environment, to the land, to the water, you gotta have uh, purification ceremonies right away. I'd like to say welcome to all of you. My name is uh, Spirit Walker. Even though I'll have a hard time trusting uh, governments and Manitoba Hydro, I think uh, now they want to talk to our people, consult with our people. Now they want to use uh, our traditional knowledge. This relationship has enabled our negotiating team to influence the design of the proposed dam in order to reduce the amount of flooding it will cause. The dam has been modified from a 350 megawatt generating station that would have flooded 140 square kilometers to a smaller 200 megawatt station that's estimated to flood less than a half a square kilometer. I'm sure that there are uncertainties, unforeseen things that can happen. The same as what, what happened with the CRD. Like the amount of damage that the CRD did was something that was unforeseen. I don't think it's, it's right to flood Mother Earth or to destroy any plants or any living things on Mother Earth because it's not only the, like the plants there, like it's everything that lives in the water that is going to be affected. It's everything that lives on the land that's going to be affected. If we take care of, of, um, of our Mother Earth and we're conscious about what we do to it, if we don't abuse it, and I don't think this was squatting project well, um, then it will always provide for us. I worked at Wisquatam at the environmental studies, um, doing the botany part, and I know what it's going to be like. Once you raise the pros and cons, I think I will. I, I know I'm going to vote for it. I'll support it. So far, the deal our leadership has negotiated will give the Nisituasik Cree Nation up to 33% of the $1 billion Wisquatam Dam. The project should be completed by about 2012 if we decide to build it. Why should we pay into something that belongs to us, that's in our resource area? You know, why should we have to pay? We should be getting royalties from this project. Well, I mean, like I feel the same way. I mean, we tried for 51% and uh, I mean, if I could get the whole thing, I'd take it. But I mean, business is business and uh, I guess the reality for us is that uh, you know, we're getting an opportunity to invest and uh, it's a tremendous amount of money. It's not some, that's money that's lying around. So, I mean, we really have to hustle and uh, do our part to make sure that it happens to get the maximum uh, investment opportunities. While many of our people feel that we should not have to pay for a project that's on our traditional territory, the fact is the government took away our legal rights to this land years ago declaring Aboriginal people as subjects of the Crown. As First Nations people, we're somewhat seen as having some kind of sovereignty, but it's just not looked at properly. We don't have that right now. But that's what we're faced with as a people, and we're trying to hang on to what we are and who we are and stay true to who we are under overwhelming forces. To pay for our share of Wasquatam, our leaders are using some of our compensation money from the Churchill River diversion, 
As well, Manitoba Hydro has offered to lend us up to two-thirds of our 33% investment in the project. It's a loan we'd have to pay back over 50 years. We could also receive profits from nearly $100 million in contracts related to construction of the dam. At what expense to the community can they push forward the project, like, you know, the, the amount of money that they're going to have to put forth? Is it, is it viable? And, and then people will say, well, it's a business thing, you know, you've got to take a risk. But you're taking a risk of all our people here. You're taking a risk of our future, who, who, who we are as Yidinwaki, you know, people. <laughs> That's, a, that's too much of a risk. We have money in, a, in our trust and we have to sacrifice a little bit. And if, if at the end of the day this um, project is going to be uh, successful and, and make a lot of money. So, I mean, somewhere along the line, we, as a community member, we have to uh, decide, well, okay, is this worth it? If it's not, well, we don't bother it. If it is, well, we go for broke. We'll be generating money right away as soon as the dam goes up. But if we have to keep borrowing money, we probably won't see money for till 2015, significant money. But I'm not really concerned about that. You know, I'm more concerned about uh, the younger generation. I'll probably get a few checks when I, as I get older, but they'll be the ones benefiting. They'll be getting 50 million a year, you know, which is a significant amount of money for a community. It doesn't matter which way you go. Whether you say no to it, you're still going to build another one further down. So you better grab it. I have gambled all my life, and this is one gamble I want to take. I want to fold yes to it. With over 60% of our population under the age of 30, our community faces many challenges, one being a severe housing shortage. Our growing economic need makes the Wasquadan project seem like an opportunity we can't afford to pass up. Housing is a major, major, it, it affects everything. You know, we have families crowded up in one house. You know, even if they do want to go to school or work or do something for themselves, the whole housing affects their, um, their willingness, I guess you can say because it is just really devastating. It, it's sad to see my community the way it is. You know, the housing is so poor. Our roads are poor. Some of the water quality is poor. You know, but, but having this money, we, could, we can all fix that. I know that money doesn't fix everything, especially socially, but it, it's the community's responsibility to look after itself. That's an enormous amount of money that could go to housing and that could go to roads to all the different organization, education being one of them. You really need the money. I've heard people comment that uh, if it doesn't go through, I'm leaving. I'm gonna go find somewhere else to, you know, to raise my family. And I've heard quite a few people say that comment. Uh, I'd be very saddened to see if the project failed, if it didn't go through, because what other uh, industry do we have or income that we can hope for uh, other than to leave the community? But we want to prosper. In order for the community to prosper, they need some you know, economic benefits, opportunities, and it's one of them. But this opportunity in and of itself uh, is indeed one opportunity that uh, has uh, the potential for significantly improving uh, uh, the well-being of, uh, of, of my people. The conditions would be so much better in Nelson House if the vote was yes. And I truly believe that. And if people that are living off reserve care for the people that live on reserve, they would support the vote yes. Along with Waswadam comes the promise of jobs and training and the construction of this $8.6 million Atascawin Training and Employment Centre. We should uh, uh, have a training facility built in our community so that our people don't have to go elsewhere. They can be trained here uh, to meet the needs of the community, but not only the needs of the community, but the, for the needs of the project and perhaps maybe future projects as uh, they may be coming along. The ATEC Center isn't just for Wisquatam. They're not going to wait five years until everybody's trained, shut it down, and move on. They're, it's, it's actually something that's going to stay within the community and train people for, for other jobs. Give the town a hold. A lot of jobs here. Probably where I'll go. 
once we have money to build houses, we can hire those plumbers, we can hire the electricians, we can hire the carpenters to build the houses we plan on buying. Like we don't, we don't want to just train these people just for the project itself. We want them for our future to start building the roads and uh, lots of good things will happen if it does work out. Maybe they could pave the streets around you. That'll cost a lot of money though. A new high school, <laughs> that's what we need. Work is very important and um, a lot of people have families so we need to work, you know, we need to. I think it's scary that I'm um, thinking about welfare and how it may eventually vanish that we have to start looking at a lot of, you know, opening employment for, because we have a growing population, I think it's important. Over the past seven years, our negotiating team has tried hard to inform the public about the Wasquadam deal through a community consultation process. In the end, it is up to each one of us to become informed about this crucial decision we are about to make. Whether our people accept or reject Wasquadam, we face a challenging future. We still teach and practice our traditional knowledge and beliefs. We provide wild food for our community. But with our growing population, we cannot exist solely off this land as we once did. And that weighs heavily upon us when we seek the blessings of our ancestors. Like just to go to and conduct ceremonies and, and get, uh, get guidance from, from their grandfathers and their grandmothers. Is it gonna work? Is it, isn't it gonna work? Because they'll tell you. If you ask them, they'll tell you. I think what I want is their forgiveness and now allow us to do that because we're doing that for the future of our people. Because like those 5,000 people from Nelson House that are living there right now, they can't live off the land anymore. Well, it is still living off the land. Like when you when you put that dam there, we'll be benefiting our people for that. And not only our people, but people throughout Turtle Island. Our ancestors want us to continue to exist. That's why our ancestors, they, they prayed for us. They fought for us and they died for us. And that's why we're still here today, to use uh, technology, but at the same time, to use our knowledge, our Indonesian, to use our customary law, to use our values, beliefs, and principles. Since the beginning of time, our people's journey has brought many challenges the most difficult being in the past few centuries. But through each trial and tribulation, our nation has managed to survive and thrive because we are strong and united. Now, as our community contemplates this crucial decision over Wasquadam, it is our strength and unity that will see us through. And as each of us casts our vote, we must decide how best to respect our ancestors and how to carry on the knowledge and belief in our traditional ways, securing a brighter future for our children. <laughs>